64 years ago uh, in the 50s, uh, not that the 50s were perfect, there was issues with the 50s, but uh, in the 50s, uh, the, the nation did have a lot of things it doesn't have today, uh, like um, respect for law, uh, respect for constitution, uh, respect for families, et cetera, et cetera. I was born in 57, so I didn't get to see it all close up, but I heard about it as I became a kid in the 60s. But back in the, those, uh, those days, uh, there was a great Bible teacher, Bible scholar, his name was Donald Barnhouse, uh, and he preached through the book of Romans, uh, it took him many years to do it, and now his uh, sermons are put into uh, several volumes, uh, which are excellent reading. Uh, but back in the 50s, uh, you can imagine, uh, this statement is amazing in light of where we are today. Here's what he said, quote, as he looked at preaching Romans chapter 1, verses 24 to 27. He says, there are some sermons that a true minister of the gospel just loves to preach. And to that I would say, oh, absolutely. And then he says, there's other sermons which it hurts to preach as the pastor. To that I would say, uh, I understand that. He says, I wish that I did not have to include this present chapter from Romans. He just wish he could just kind of go around it. But he said, when one sets out to be an expositor of the word of God and takes every verse, every line, every phrase, and every word, just as they come, there's moments when the terrible things of God they arrive in the narrative, and they must be treated. I completely understand that. I can tell you why a lot of pastors preach uh, topically. Do you know why? Uh, because you come to passages that uh, are problematic for you. You don't want to talk about them, and so you can just bypass them. Uh, it, it, there's a place for topical preaching. Uh, I'm more like Barnhouse, the line by line, word by word, chapter by chapter, uh, thinking through what the Word of God says. And when you do that, you're going to run into things as a speaker that, well, I don't know if I really, I'm comfortable talking about that. Uh, but you have a mandate from God to preach the word. And so I'm a kind of pastor that, uh, to me, the most important thing is the word of God, has the answers for life in it. I believe it's the inspired word of God. There is no other word of God. And so I'm under mandate to speak. So I don't do this job because I like the weather here, uh, because... <laughs> I like the freeway system here. I love the trees here. Uh, uh, the people, I do love the people. Um, what else do I love? Chipmunks and things like that. Uh, but it really, I mean, like, why do I do what I do? I mean, I've told Liz many times, if I was going to go do something else, and I've had those moments in my pastoral career where I've been frustrated, discouraged, et cetera, where I thought, I just, I just have to just do something different. Like what? Uh, because I can't do anything different because I've been called by God to do this. And I know I'm called of God to do it. Uh, and he called me when I was a teenager. I absolutely knew he wanted me to pa pastor and teach the word of God. Uh, and with that comes a responsibility that I can't go around things that I might not like to talk about. Like Romans 1, 24 to 27. Because you could not pick a more volatile passage, culturally speaking, than this passage. Because what Paul is going to do is going to say, let's talk about a life that rejects God. Where does it go? Well, it goes downward. And as it heads downward in a spiral of sin, what kind of sin does it get involved with? And what he's going to say is not going to be, as you're going to see, culturally sensitive, but it's the word of God that must be spoken. And so I understand uh, what Barnhouse said, uh, that God's truth must be spoken. But I also understand uh, from having two degrees in the Old Testament, uh, the life of a prophet. Because I've studied the prophets many times over the years in uh, college and grad school and beyond. Uh, and I identify with the prophets as a pastor. Now, the prophets had a twofold role. Uh, and this is going to be a very long introduction, so just, just go with it. Because um, I have to uh, prepare the ground for what we're going to talk about really next week. So Because I know the church, you're going to say, why didn't you say this? And why didn't you talk about that? When, so I'm, I'm anticipating, uh, I'm laying the groundwork so we can really have a discussion about aberrant sexuality, which is what happens with people when they reject God. But we'll get there eventually. Um, what were we talking about? Oh, the prophetic role. Uh, it's hard being 60, isn't it? Uh, uh, it's twofold. He's a, he's a foreteller and he's a fourth teller. Foreteller of the future by divine inspiration and a fourth teller of what is true behavior as opposed to which is aberrant behavior. Uh, you can imagine based on those uh, uh, two concepts, they were not the favored people in the, the, the declining culture of Israel. And so when you look at the, the, the prophets, I don't identify uh, with the uh, prophetic side of the role of a, of a prophet. I, I identify uh, theologically with the uh, forth-telling nature of that, that I am under mandate to speak the word of God, to call people away from sin to that which God finds as honorable behavior. Uh, and with that role of a prophet uh, comes several things. Number one, uh, I know from a prophetic role from studying the Old Testament that to a prophet, nothing's trivial. 
I mean, when it comes to sin and that which is holy, uh, it's, it's amplified to them because they see the trajectory. If you choose this godly directory, it leads to this kind of life. If you choose a godless directory, even if you're off a couple of degrees, your trajectory is ultimately evil. So a prophet sees that and cries the alarm to people when they're like, what are you so excited about? Uh, I know a prophet uh, is in many respects um, what you might call an iconoclast because what the culture says is not what he says. He says, this is what God Almighty says, and it's an absolute truth that never changes. This is what the culture says. This is inappropriate. This is sinful. This you, Repentance is needed. So in a sense, I feel like that, uh, and you should feel like that as a Christian because you don't quite fit in because you represent the truth of God. I understand the prophetic role uh, as laid out by the book of Amos, uh, Amos, a prophet um, of God, speaking to the godless nation, says in Amos chapter 5, verse 10, quote, they hate him who reproves in the gate. And in the gate in ancient Israel of the city is where they did all their legal actions. It says they, he, they hate him who reproves in the gate. They abhor him who speaks the truth. Do they not? Such is my culture. Um, those who do not want to hear the truth call you the one who speaks the truth. What? What? Hateful. When it really, the discussion is really about hate. It's hating the things of God. See? Because there's things that God finds that are inappropriate and sinful, and he abhors them, hates them, says so in the book of Proverbs. And so they say, when you stand up in the gate and reprove that which is evil, the culture's not going to embrace you. Well, I understand that, but I would rather speak truth than error. And by the way, on Judgment Day, I fully believe, since I don't just do this as a job, I do as a calling, one day I stand before God toe-to-toe, -to -toe, you're not going to be there. And I'm sure I'm going to have to give account. How did you preach the word? How did you study the word? Uh, did you get, were, you, were you true to the text? Uh, did you show compassion? Did you, uh, uh, he's going to test me whether, or how I did as a shepherd. Uh, and I want to be able to hear the words from him. Well done, good and faithful servant. And so uh, I'm that kind of man. I'm a man who identifies with Jeremiah. Jeremiah, who was known as the weeping prophet because his culture was going off the cliff uh, and no one would listen to him. Uh, he said in uh, his book, Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9, if I say then I will not mention him because the culture was telling him to quit talking about God or speak any more in his name, then in my heart, it, God's word, becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones and I am weary from holding it all in and I cannot endure it. I totally understand that because the culture says, well, don't talk about that. It makes people uncomfortable. Don't talk about that. It's, you're going to lose a prisoner. Don't talk about that. You're going to get a hateful email. No. I, I've got to speak the word of God. Why? Because it's the truth the culture needs that turns people away from sin back to God. And if I don't speak it, it's a fire in my bones. Paul said, 1 Corinthians 9, For if I preach, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion, divine compulsion. It says, For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. That's me. Hopefully that's you. I mean, if I do not tell my world the gospel of God, the bad news that God will judge sin, and the good news is he died for sin and sinners and can grant you life eternal and forgiveness. If I do not give them the balanced approach of the gospel, then Paul says, woe is me. I totally understand that. And so when we look at the book of Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and following, uh, in verses 16 to 17, he's been giving us the gospel, the good news. It has the power to redeem a person. Then in verse 18, it kind of gets to where you're just in your collar because he's talking about that word wrath. The wrath of God is revealed against who? All those who take the evidence that he built into the cosmos, that he exists, and they work against it to not worship God, they worship themselves. So then he's going to tell you, when man reject general revelation, which then won't lead them to special revelation, i.e. the Bible, What's God do? Does he sit in heaven and go, ah, you're really making some really lousy choices. Now, what, what's he do? Well, that's what he gets at in verse 24. Notice what happens. Verse 24. The word therefore is like a legal term in Greek. It's a summation of, in like an attorney in a court of law, it's a summation of his argument. If you reject God's existence based on the revelation he's embedded into the cosmos, what happens? Therefore, God does what? He gave them up over to what? One word. Uh, to what? L lust. W what? Where, the lust of their hearts, which he's going to say is going to result in impurity. So that when they do this with their bodies, he says, they would then be dishonored among them. For, he says, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. So when they didn't want God, they shoved God off the throne. They put something else on the throne of their life. What then happened? He says, well, then they worship and serve the creature, man, rather than the creator. And then he stops because he's so overcome with who God is. 
Maybe that's happened to you before. You just think about God and the greatness of God, the love of God, and you just stop. And what's he do? Who is God to him, the creator? He is blessed forevermore. Amen. He just stops. The small doxology. Then he gets back into saying what God does with those who reject him. It says, for this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. Well, what kind of degrading passions? Well, if you shove God off your throne and you put yourself on the throne, you're going to worship everything you think is right for you. Like what? Degrading passions. The women in the Roman culture that he's addressing exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural. You can use your imagination what he's talking about. It says, and in the same way also the man abandoned their natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. What does that mean, Paul? Men with men committing acts that are indecent, receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And now you understand why that passage is a problematic passage. What's the culture say? I mean, just as, as I had one person tell me one time, just get over it. The, the Supreme Court made a decision. I can't get over it. It's the word of God. It never changes. It never changes. We need to look at this because when man refuses God, he worships other gods of his own making. And Paul says what's most interesting is the very top God of mankind, and we can totally see it in our culture, is a deviant form of sexuality that is not optimal. It's a distortion from what God designed it to be. Um, truth is what we talk about. The truth of chapter one versus the belief system of our current culture. I want to talk about truth because I'm still doing my introduction if you're with me. <laughs> I want to talk about truth because our culture doesn't understand truth anymore. It's all relative to them. But uh, here's a, a profound statement by Dr. Geisler, uh, which I came across in studying underneath him one day. He, he said this, quote, Contrary to what is being taught in public schools, truth is not relative, but absolute. He says, if something is true, it's true for all people at all times and in all places. He says, all truth claims are absolute, narrow, and exclusive. He says, just to think about the claim, quote, everything is true, quote, he says, that's an absolute, and it's narrow, and it's exclusive, is it not? So the person who's going to say absolute truth doesn't exist, especially when it comes to morals, well, they just made an absolute statement. You, you follow the, the reasoning of your culture? Because this is what they want. If there is no absolute truth, then I can do with myself what I want to if I reject God. I put myself on the throne, and I can be as deviant as I want to and call it good. I want to talk about truth for just a minute because our culture's lost sight of what is true. Because chapter one is about true sexual behavior as opposed to that which is aberrant. Number one, Truth, if you study truth, it's discovered, not invented. Because if you invent truth as you're taking a geometry class, what's going to happen to your grade? <laughs> Did you take geometry? Yeah, I just kind of go with the flow, man. I don't know, you know. I just come up with my own theorems. I, mean, I remember sitting in my first geometry class in high school. I think I was a junior. Looking at all those theorems thinking, what's it matter? Who cares? Then I became a landscaper <laughs> and had to come up with how much volume of dirt do you need? How many bricks do you need? All of a sudden, some, some other landscaper told me, it's, it's geometry, man. All of a sudden, I had to learn geometry, etc. So if you're a student today, follow, yeah, don't, you know, don't do what I did. Study the theorems. You, know, you, don't, discover, I mean, you, just, you don't discover these things. All that stuff, or you don't do, invent them. They're there. Those theorems are there, right? Uh, gravity is gravity, whether you think about it being there or not, right? Uh, two, uh, truth is transcultural. So if two plus two is four here, like in Burke, you go to Tel Aviv, guess what? Two plus two is four. And if you go to New Delhi, guess what? Two plus two is four. Why? Because mathematic principles are transcultural. If you, if you were an engineer and you went to go work on a bridge in New Delhi, and they, when they got there, they told you, you said, well, you know, based on my computations, it's this. And they said, hey, here, two plus two is seven. You're getting back on the plane, Right? Truth is called, and here's the point. If mathematical concepts are absolute, and they are, why wouldn't it be absolute when it comes to more important things like moral law, sexual law, right and wrong? Truth is unchanging even though our beliefs about truth change. Remember back in the day when they used to believe the earth was flat? I mean, that's what they used to believe, remember? And what did they do with all the maps when you got near Spain? You're heading out into the open ocean. Like, do you remember what they did with the maps? What'd they draw on the maps? Dragons. And what, they were just trying to be in pragmatists. What were they saying? Hey, if you sell your little ship out there, it's over. You're going to go off the edge. It's over. It's flat. Did that change the fact that the earth was not flat? No. No. So truth is unchanging even though our beliefs about truth change. 
Next, beliefs cannot change a fact no matter how sincerely they're held. You can be as sincere as you want about 2 plus 2 being 7. It doesn't change the fact that 2 plus 2 is 4. You can say, man, he is so passionate about 2 plus 2 is 7. I just appreciate his passion for that. He's wrong. Truth doesn't change no matter how passionate you are about it. Truth is not affected by the attitude of the one professing it. An arrogant person does not make the truth he professes false. You follow the reasoning? I'll say it again in case you're kind of looking like the deer in headlights. I'll say it again. An arrogant person does not make the truth he professes false. Nor does a humble person make the error that he professes true. Well, I'm just humbly submitting to you. Two plus two is seven. You can be as humble as you want. You're dead wrong. Um, truth, uh, as Geyser points out, is, is all absolute. You can't get away from absolutes. It's built into the warp and woof of the cosmos. And to that last point, I would add, truth corresponds to the facts. It's just what the facts are. So you would assume that if God is built into the cosmos, which he has, truths like mathematical, chemistry, truths, whatever, that when you jumped over to more important things like sexuality and how we should live to honor God, that there would be truths there that would be uh, un unequivocal. And there are, as Paul's going to say. But our culture hasn't got the memo on truth. To them it's relative and I can do what I want to. It's a God of my life. Uh, this leads to what we would call, uh, I'm still doing my introduction, by the way. Hopefully you're with me. Pragmatism. We're big on this in the United States. Well, how do you know that's true? Well, for me, son, it works. And because it works, I made a summation. It must be true, right? Have you ever believed things that logically kind of worked out but were dangerous? I mean, never, right? Is, is pragmatism a great way to validate truth? No, here's why. R.C. Sproul, who great Christian uh, thinker, uh, writer, apologist, recently went home to be with the Lord. He wrote this uh, uh, in one of his books called Life Views about pragmatism as a valuation for truth. If truth is determined by what works for the individual, then the test for truth ultimately becomes the individual. What's wrong with that? Is everybody like 100%? I mean, if somebody's like off because of sin, because we're born with it, then their measurement's going to be off. I remember when I was uh, uh, 15 years old, I had a desire with my cousin when we were in Spain with my uncle Tony, Antonio Sanchez. He's from Barcelona. So they were in Spain for a month seeing the old country. So we go down to Tormel we're, we're Tormelino, Spain. We're on the coastline. It's beautiful. You know, I'm 15. I, I think my cousin was 13. And we see we, on the beach, it's beautiful. Mediterranean is awesome. Uh, we see a paddle boat. And so we tell my uncle, hey, could you rent that for us? He knows our propensity. He's like, well, you know, uh, as long as you guys like hug the coastline, I mean, don't disappear on me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We felt like it was just wonderful to kind of just pragmatically do what we wanted to do. Head, head out into the ocean. And so we, we said, we'll be good. We'll constantly look at that red umbrella where you are. And we won't, you know, we'll just stay right there where the waves are. And so when we got that little boat, you ever paddle boated? Yeah, this is, the, this is amazing what happened to us. We get the paddle boat, we stick it in the water, we go through the first couple of waves, and we paddle to Africa. We are, <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, we are just beelining it as fast as our little uh, teenage legs can take us. And then after a while, we got out there to where we, we were kind of spooked when an ocean liner went by and we could see the people in the windows. <laughs> I kid you, that is not a pastoral hyperbolic statement. We could see them because they're looking at us like, whoa paddle boat. Um, we realized at that point, our version of truth and reality had just met reality. Uh, we were in grave danger because our pragmatic analysis of truth was about to erupt and we couldn't see where we were supposed to go. So what we did uh, is we would get on these really high 15 to 20 foot swells in a paddle boat uh, and we would look like where's the land and then at the top of the swell we'd paddle like mad to get to the next place. And they're down in a down in a swell. We crest and we'd paddle. We go down. We'd paddle. Now, obviously, I made it back. It was about a five week journey. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. But if I were to tell you, I validate how to do a paddleboat based on my pragmatic experience. Uh, no. So just because something works doesn't mean it's true. Just because a lifestyle someone says works for me doesn't mean it's true. That's what Paul's going to say. Still in my introduction. Some preparatory things to think about then in light of truth, how God has made truth. One, just because our culture has redefined and codified what constitutes viable sexual relationships does not mean the conclusion is true. God's word is true. Two, just because I know people who engage in activity the Bible condemns as dangerous and not optimal does not mean their activity trumps the Bible because the Bible's true, not the activity. 
three. Just because a person's moral and sexual life uh, results in them feeling uh, marginalized, unfortunately, um, wherever they are, uh, does not change truth. Remember David? What were his sins? No, before Bathsheba. I mean, well, yeah, he lied, killed her husband, had a relationship with her. I mean, it was bad. It was as bad as bad it could get. You can imagine in his sin if he said, I'm just feeling marginalized by Israel because I'm enjoying my lifestyle. And so I need to change how Israel looks at my sexual sin because I, I, I don't want to be marginalized. That's not what happened. The prophet comes to him and tells him, David, you're the man. You have sinned. He confesses and he turns away from God or turns back to God. And Psalm 51 is about his confession. And he comes back to God and worships God. David's activities didn't change truth. He had sinned. Just because you feel good about a given choice, life choice, doesn't mean the feel-good factor is truth. It can be a deception. And then lastly, just because I don't agree with sexual choices that everybody makes that are all over the place, doesn't mean I hate you. No, I love you. Enough to tell you, this is what God said is optimal. And anything less from that is a distortion and is, is, and it is sinful, no, no matter what it is. Because what's optimal? Man and a woman in a relationship, holy matrimony, in the confines of marriage, period. That's what Paul says. And so he looks at his Roman culture that's off the grid, and he addresses them as rejecting God, and here's the logical result. Rejection, he's going to tell them, is very costly, Notice what he says. He says, if you reject God, it leads to sexual sin by definition because that's the thing man honors the most in his life. And that becomes what we would call dishonorable. That's what he says. He says, therefore, God gave them over to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, so their bodies would be dishonored among them. See, these are concepts our culture has completely forgotten. They, first of all, they would never want to bring about the notion that God would give anybody over to their sin. But God's going to say, uh, like the prodigal son's father did, son, if you want to take your inheritance and go live a wild life, have at it. You're going to find that's not the optimal way to live. Where was the prodigal's father when the prodigal realized that his activities were not optimal? Where was the dad with his arms wide open at home waiting for his son? I see him. I see him. See, eventually the prodigal's father gave his son up to his son, but the son eventually got the son's attention. He came back to his dad. This is God. He gives sinners up who reject him two ways, actively and passively. Actively, he works in your life to get your attention by removing his protective barriers. And then he, he acts passively where he says, if that's the way you want to live and it's not optimal, that's not what I've said, then it's going to have certain downward spirals that you're going to run into. And he says, when you do this, I will give you over to the lust of your heart to impurity. And the word for impurity is, uh, is a word used in the New Testament of any kind of sexual sin not just the ones he's going to list. So as we talk about the kinds of sexual sin listed here, realize he's really talking about the whole spectrum of sexual sin. That when you do this, he says, God will give you over to the deviation. He calls it a lust. Now what is interesting about the word lust is uh, it's, the, it's the word epithumia, the word lust, but it's translated differently in, in our Bibles. It's tra translated uh, lust, uh, it's translated coveting, and it's also translated desire. So if you read it in the English text throughout the Old and New Testament, you might not be able to see the word. But if you read the original text, you can see where epithumia occurs, which is most interesting. Is all desire bad? No. no. I can think of a lot of good things that are desire, desirable to, to, to have. Paul says in First uh, Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, If any man aspires to the office of an overseer, an elder at a church, he desires, epithumia, a good work. So to want to be a spiritual leader in the church, epithumia, great desire. But when does desire become sinful? Well, you're thinking, well, I, I didn't know desire was sinful. Because my culture says all desires are optimal. That's not what God says. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 28. He says, but I say to you that everyone who looks upon a woman, if you're married, to lust, epithumeo, lust. It's now translated lust. Uh, for her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. So the, the Pharisee said, it's only uh, adultery if I do it. What does Jesus say? Oh, you measure wrong. I say, let's look at the law. So let's think about the law. The seventh and the tenth commandment. The tenth, seventh commandment said, you shall not commit adultery. So what the Pharisees say, it only counts if I actually have someone else's wife. What does Jesus say? No. The tenth commandment is, you shall not covet anything that your neighbor has, even his wife. So what does Jesus say? The coveting, epithumeo, the desire 
is as if you did it. We loosen what God tightens and tighten what he loosens. This is what we do so that we can do our sin. Epithumeo. Just the desire is sinful if the object is forbidden. Follow? If the object is forbidden, i.e. another man's wife, then I am in sin for the interior desire, which leads to the conclusion that if you think all different kinds of sexual activity is fine because you desire it, if the object is wrong according to the scriptures, it's sin, pure and simple. When you engage in sexual activity, it runs counter to God's design. So what happens? He says, you dishonor your body. Our culture totally doesn't even understand that concept anymore. Now they do anything and everything with their bodies. And they call it what? Hey, I'm just doing what's true and works for me. And as long as I don't hurt anybody, it should be good. This is what they do. And so what they do when they, because they know, because God made them this way, they have a conscience that tells them what you're doing is dishonorable. And they feel the dishonor internally in their conscience. So what do they do? Well, I'm, I'm a man born in sin. I understand how sin operates. So what do sinners do when they're rejecting God's ways? Oh, a couple things like this. Number one, they surround themselves with like-minded people so they can feel normal and acceptable about what they're doing. Who has not done that? Two, they surround themselves with like-minded people so they can silence their conscience that convicts them. Because if you come to me with the fact that you're doing something God doesn't approve, am I going to come alongside you and go, oh, it's totally wonderful to feel your feelings, do what you want, follow your desires. Am I going to say that? Uh, probably not. I'm going to lovingly tell you, you need to come back from the edge. That's not how God designed things. But you're going to go to friends who are going to tell you exactly what you want to hear so your conscience then goes away. Third, they seek to educate everyone around them that what they're doing, if it's sexually deviant, is normal and everyone should accept it, ipso facto. And then lastly, they verbally label those who do not support what they're doing as, well, a whole bunch of labels. You, have you heard the labels? You're intolerant. You're unloving. You're unkind. You're hateful. You're, I mean, there's just a whole long list. Then they just ended the discussion. No, I love you enough to tell you God said this is awesome. This is not, no matter what your desires tell you. You know, Paul looks to the uh, compromised uh, Corinthians and, uh, who lived uh, at the base of the Acro-Corinthian hill of the temple of Aphrodite, uh, temple of sex goddess. It was, the whole city was a, just enthralled with it. And he tells them in uh, these former uh, worshipers of deviant things, he tells them in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 6, and, six and such were some of you, such were some of you, but you are washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. That used to be you. You used to buy into all those false desires and notions and your conscience was dirty and you knew it and you were dishonored and you knew it, but you lived as if you weren't. But then God convicted you, you saw your sin and you saw Christ and the power of the gospel now you're a saved, washed, justified person. Paul says, there's nothing better. You don't know where you're at in your life, uh, but if you're at that point where you have been deceptively holding on to all this kind of deviation, which pushes God off the throne of your life, the minute you come clean of all that and say, God, I, I, I know what I'm doing. I'm not fooling you. The minute you say, God, I want you on the throne of my life, there is no greater place to be in your life. He'll make you something that will blow your mind. If you don't do that, verse 25 kicks in. It says, for they, those people who continue to reject God, they exchange the truth of God for a what? A lie. Because man has got to worship somebody. What was that song from the 60s? My mind went blank. That you got to worship somebody. Does anybody remember? Bob yeah, Bob, it was Bob Dylan, wasn't it? Wasn't he right? We're wired to worship if I walk away from God, I'm going to stick something else up there to worship. And what does man by definition worship? Himself and his desires. And at the top of the list of his desires is sexuality. I mean, think of our country. I mean, I look at it and think, what happened to Hollywood? No, I'm serious. I mean, what happened? What do they worship? Deviant sexuality. Come, I see it in the films. I mean, who hasn't walked out of a movie? I mean, I check them out, I read the things, and then you get there and it's like, you have got to be kidding me. They rated this, what? I'm out. Who hasn't taken a DVD? You're watching it, same thing. It's like, you have got to be kidding me. And then, then they're going off the grid, are they not? What's been their God? Sexuality deviant. What's wrong with the culture? They've rejected God. 
and because they put false sexuality on that throne, then any kind of sexuality is okay. Then everything's okay. Chaos and downward spiral of sin. What's the answer? It's pretty simple. What's the answer? They need Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ. They need to say, God, I know you exist and I'm gonna be held accountable for my activities one day. And I want you on the throne of my life, not me, because I have messed up that throne. And I have gone from deviation to deviation and called it normal when I know it's not. Redeem me and save me. And he will in a profound way and make you a person that you never thought you could be with desires that are optimal and wonderful and awesome. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for who you are and for the power of the word of God. Indeed, uh, some scriptures as these are hard to listen to. If we're honest, they're hard to speak about, they're hard to preach about, but they are your words. Help us to be honest enough to take our thinking, our feelings, and, and lay it alongside your word and say, God, help me to be the kind of person that measures my life against that which is absolutely true in all areas of my life, down to the sexuality and how you've created us. Might we put you first above all things. Thank you for the wonder it is and how you've made us, for the joy that it is to know you, to walk with you. Give us love and compassion for those around us who still haven't come to terms with who you are. May we be patient toward them in Christ's name. Amen.